First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. How can I help you? Hello. My name's Kevin Brown. I saw your advertisement in today's local paper, Apartments to Let in All Areas of the City. Yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, we currently have several properties available. What part of the city were you thinking of? Well, city centre, ideally. OK. And what price range are you interested in? Um, I don't really know. What have you got? Well, uh, prices start at £400 a month, going up to £1,000 a month. OK. And what's the difference? What does the price depend on? Well, uh, the number of bedrooms, mainly. Uh -huh. The cheaper apartments have one bedroom, while the most expensive have three or four bedrooms. OK. Two bedrooms would be nice. So I'll say two bedrooms up to 600 a month. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Right, sir. We have... Uh, just give me a moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have two properties that might interest you. One is in North Street... It's, uh, well, it's, uh, it's a very nice apartment, uh, but it's £750 a month. Uh, but that includes a private parking space. Hmm, £750. That's a bit higher than I'd like to go, really. Do you have anything less expensive? Uh, yes. Uh, we have another one at £625 a month. £625? Mm -hmm. All right, that sounds interesting. Where is it? It's in Cornell Road, at number 12B. I don't know that. How do you spell it? It's C-O-R-N-E-L-L. -L. It's near the park. I've never heard of it, but I'm sure I'll be able to find it on a map. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. So, would you like to see the apartment, sir? Yes, I would. I'd like to rent somewhere fairly soon. Mm -hmm. Would tomorrow be possible? Uh, uh, sorry, I'm afraid nobody is available all day tomorrow. It's quite a busy time of year for us. I see. But if you're free later today, you could see it at 5.15. Sure, no problem. I could manage that. OK. So that'll be uh, 5.15 with my colleague Jason. Hmm. He'll meet you at the apartment. That's fine. And one more thing. What do I need to provide to rent an apartment with you? What documents, that kind of thing? Yes, of course. Um, do you have a job? Yes, I work in a travel agency. Well, uh, a reference letter from your employer, you know, saying you work for them, and a deposit, which is one month's rent plus a fee of £60. What's that for? It's an administration fee to cover the cost of preparing the contract. OK. And one last thing. When would this apartment be available? It's empty now, so you could move in as soon as the contract was signed. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Brown. <laughs> that is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 2. You will hear a member of the local council describing plans to redevelop part of the seafront of a coastal town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Clearly, this is an issue of great local interest. Thank you all for coming. Well, as you all know, I've come to talk about the Council's plans for redeveloping the western part of the seafront. Firstly, of course, the Queen's Parade shopping centre is to be demolished. It was built on the cheap and in a hurry in 1953 and recently came third in a national newspaper's ugliest buildings in the country list, so I don't think anybody's going to miss it. The question was, what do we replace it with? Well, after consultations with the local community, we decided as I'm sure most of you are aware, to replace it with a complex of small shops and workshops, plus a three-screen cinema. We particularly didn't want another bland glass and steel shopping centre full of the same old chain stores as every other town centre. No, this is our chance to do something just a little bit different. I'll start at the top. On the third floor will be a cafe and a restaurant. Part of this will be open air, so people can enjoy a meal or a cup of coffee in the fresh air, weather permitting, of course. Below this will be the cinema, and below that, on the first floor, will be some much-needed council offices. We're getting very cramped in the town hall, I can assure you. On the ground floor will be 20 small shop units, ranging in size from 20 to 50 square metres. Also on the ground floor will be five workshop spaces, which we hope will attract small manufacturing businesses back to the town centre, providing some additional local employment. Underneath the centre will be an underground car park, not a great big car park like in the present centre. Our aim is that most visitors to the centre will come on foot or by bus. In fact, the car park will be restricted to people working in the centre and disabled visitors. Then, and perhaps this is the most exciting part of the project, the beach in front of the new complex is going to be completely transformed we're going to extend the beach. Yes, extend it. 10,000 tonnes of sand is going to be brought in to make it into a proper beach instead of the dirty little strip of sand it is now. As well as being for the enjoyment of local people, we're hoping that a decent beach will attract more visitors to the town and that has to be good for local businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I must emphasise that these plans have not yet been finalised. That's what this meeting is about. 
Of course, it's vital with a project like this that we have the support of local people. After all, we work for you and it's your money that's paying for it. So, first of all, the plans for the new centre are going to go on display in the Town Hall. They'll be there from Monday the 5th of March until Friday the 6th of April. Uh, plenty of time for anybody who's interested to get over there and have a look at them, I think. There'll be a suggestions box in the same room as the plans. Anybody who has anything to say is welcome to fill in a suggestions form. These forms will be looked at and taken seriously. You can be sure of that. Then on Tuesday, April the 10th, there'll be another public meeting much like this one and in this same place. It'll start at seven o'clock and there'll be a chance for local residents to address the council. We'll also report back to you on the results gathered in the suggestions box. Anyway, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, my fellow councillor. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. Maria is a student at university. She has handed the first draft of an essay to her tutor. The tutor has read it, and now they are discussing ways the essay can be improved. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, Maria, I have to say I was quite impressed by your essay. <laughs> it's a big improvement on the last one. Really? I'm glad. I put a lot more work into this one. I really spent ages on it. Mm. And it shows. You've addressed most of the problems I pointed out last time. In particular, the style and language are much more appropriate for an academic essay. So that aspect is OK? Absolutely. If you carry on like this, you shouldn't have any significant problems in that department. That's a relief. I've been quite worried about that, although I've been reading a lot of other essays to try to get the right style. Well, I'd say you've been successful. There are just one or two minor things you could look at, uh, your punctuation's quite basic. It's really just full stops and commas. And parentheses. Brackets? Y yes, brackets if you prefer. In academic writing, these are best used only occasionally, if at all. You use them rather too often. OK, I see. And uh, I'm sorry to mention it, but your spelling i know i know but i'm working on a foreign computer the spell checker doesn't work for english are you sure have you tried changing the setting to english no i haven't well i should see if that's possible i haven't marked you down this time but well some of my colleagues are a bit old-fashioned about spelling i'd try to get that sorted out if i were you OK, I understand. I'll try to change the setting. Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The only major problem I have with the content of your essay is the introduction. Mm. The introduction should, well, introduce the theme of the essay. Mm. You've put some of the most important points there. <laughs> For example, this bit. Um, yeah, the statistics about the growth of railways in the 1850s. That really should go in the main body of the essay. Yeah. And so should this paragraph about changes in patterns of employment. In general, I'd say your introductory section should be no more than half as long as it is at the moment. Mm, OK. And I should move those points forward? Precisely. And going back to the railways, they're one of the most significant factors for change in this period. Mm. But apart from those statistics in the introduction, you only briefly mention them. Ah. I'd like to see a lot more on that. And the influence the expansion of the railways had on patterns of social and economic behaviour. You mean how with the railways people could travel to find work and could meet people from other areas? E exactly. Then in the midsection, well, it's not a big thing, but this quotation from the Times. You think it's too long? <sighs> Well, you said it. <laughs> I, I couldn't think of a way to shorten it. Do you think it's really necessary? You mean I could just get rid of it? Yes. You've already made the point and backed it up with other evidence. The quotation's redundant, really. OK. Well, that'll be easy. There were various other minor points, uh, which I've noted in the margins. Mm. You can look at those later. But moving forward to the end here... <sighs> I wasn't quite sure what this meant. The final paragraph? Yes. Are you saying that, on the whole, the changes of the mid-19th century tended to improve the lives of ordinary people or not? It's not very clear. Mm, it's not? No, it isn't. I'd add a few lines clarifying your position. OK. When do you want the final draft? No, uh, the end of term will be fine. Um, but there was just one other thing, the bibliography. Did you really read all these books? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> just the books you actually consulted will be fine. You don't need to include everything ever published on the subject. <laughs> right, OK. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk about stray cats. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening. I'd like to introduce Laura Dongswell of the Feral Cat Association. Laura has just returned from spending three months in Italy where she has been working with local organisations 
to improve conditions for some of the estimated one and a half million ownerless cats currently thought to be at large there. Thank you very much. The principal problem regarding this issue is much the same in Italy as it is in other countries. Public awareness. The general public have become so used to the sight of ownerless cats in poor condition wandering their streets that they simply don't recognise it as a problem. While some will put out scraps of food, the majority see feral cats in much the same light as, say, seagulls. A form of local wildlife which is of no particular concern to or responsibility of the human population. Of course, there are plenty of individuals who do take responsibility for cats in their areas, providing appropriate food, emergency veterinary treatment and perhaps indoor shelter. But these people can only provide support for a fraction of the vast numbers of feral cats that exist. So, what's to be done? Find loving family homes for all feral cats? Well, that would be wonderful, of course, but unlikely to happen any time soon. The two main focuses of our work are sterilisation and education. Sterilisation is usually only performed on female animals. It may seem a drastic intervention, but it benefits both the sterilised cats who will not have to suffer the health consequences of endless pregnancies and also the feral cat population as a whole, as controlling numbers reduces competition for whatever slender resources of food may exist. Animals to be neutered are captured and sedated at the point of capture to minimise their stress and discomfort. They are then taken to a temporary centre set up by a local organisation and the operations are carried out under anaesthetic by trained veterinary surgeons, all of whom kindly donate their time. Now, while domestic cats can recuperate in the comfort of their owners' homes, feral cats have no such luxury. They are kept at the centre for around 24 hours, then returned to the locality from which they came. Dissolving stitches are used, and each cat that has been operated on has the tip of one ear clipped, a sign that the animal has already been neutered. A few animals have been electronically tagged and their progress monitored. In general, it has been found that neutering does not diminish an animal's chances of survival. On the contrary, the evidence suggests that sterilised females have a significantly improved chance of remaining in adequate health. The other focus of our work is, as I said, education, publicising the issue and raising awareness. Our current poster campaign is a translation of the widely used slogan, a kitten is not just for Christmas. At present, resources are rather limited, but, funds permitting, a campaign of radio advertisements is planned, perhaps in the run-up to next Christmas, reminding people that families may quickly become bored with the responsibility of owning a domestic animal. Last year, we used newspaper ads featuring pictures of emaciated strays and highlighting the fact that abandoning an animal simply transfers your problem to somebody else. Which leads me on to the final point I'd like to make. Organisations such as ours are sometimes depicted as being mainly for sentimental animal lovers. Well, I make no apology for that, but our work has a wider importance than the welfare of cats. Ownerless cats tend to quickly fall into ill health and can become a health hazard in various ways, including the spreading of disease and parasites. Children can be especially vulnerable to this, as they are more likely to handle an infected or infested animal. Thank you very much, Laura. 
That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.